Hi and welcome. I'm Philip and I want to talk a bit about security trade-offs in Elasticsearch to you. So let me share my screen and we'll take it from there. So here we go. Um, security trade-offs in Elasticsearch. Um, why am I picking this topic to talk about? So I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch. My official title is Developer Advocate, so I mostly talk about the good stuff that we do. But today I want to take the opportunity and talk a bit about the stuff that maybe wasn't always that great or things that we have learned over the past years. So this is a bit about the story of how you can improve your own product over time. If you have never heard of Elasticsearch, this is the Elastic stack where Elasticsearch is sitting in the middle as kind of like the data store. Um, it has a REST API, it's scalable. It's very widely used. If you search on GitHub, Wikipedia, Stick Overflow, behind the search box, there is always Elasticsearch doing the search for you. Or it's very widely used in many other use cases around logs, also in security use cases. But that shouldn't be the topic. I really want to talk a bit about the evolution of Elasticsearch or more broadly, how NoSQL data stores approach security generally. So let's dive into that. Um, this one is, of course, a joke. Um, yes, the best argument for NoSQL is that you can have SQL injections um, if you don't have SQL. is kind of true, but that's not really the point. The idea here is really more, did NoSQL improve security overall for data stores? Yes or no? And for that, we probably have to go a bit through uh, development and where we are going. So, the thesis I want to have is that Initially, you're very focused on the ease of use to grow and, well, get your product out there. And as you progress along, things will change, but we will come back to this thesis pretty much at the end. So we start with the premise that the ease of use to grow is kind of fundamental. So part of that was that initially Elasticsearch was always binding to all the interfaces, which was great if you wanted to demo some clustering and you would just start the binary, it would bind to all interfaces, and then you could easily form a cluster with other nodes. Obviously, for security reasons, this is not what you want. And since Elasticsearch 2.0, which was years and years and years ago, um, Elasticsearch is not doing that anymore. So it is only binding to local host by default. Um, and we'll get back to why that is important and why this still doesn't solve all the problems. But this is something that you really want to have. Um, not to surprise people, they just start your product and then suddenly they run a service and whoever wants to reach that might reach that. You don't want to be in that position. Um, the next thing that we did initially in Elasticsearch was work. we're clustering automatically. So besides finding to all interfaces by default, um, Elasticsearch would also listen and broadcast on the local subnet to see are there any other Elasticsearch nodes with the default Elasticsearch cluster name, but every cluster would have the same by default. So it was kind of a funny story when I was running my first Elasticsearch training way before joining Elastic, um, that I had a lot, couple of students in one subnet and each one was starting their own Elasticsearch node. And those would just cluster automatically or form one big cluster because the binary is bound to all interfaces and the cluster was just scanning the local subnet for other instances. Everybody was using the default configuration, so they had one big nice cluster, which was an interesting experience and showed how easy that was, but it also showed the problem that it might create chaos. That if someone on one end inserts some data and somebody else tries to delete data and the whole thing they're doing that locally, um, they might be doing that to the data of somebody else. Not something you really want to have, um, which might be even worse. Let's assume you VPN to your production system and then your local test installation clusters with that installation there that might lead to a very bad day when you think you drop some data locally and maybe you actually do that in production. Um, so that's another thing what we stopped doing at some point just because it was very easy to get started. But generally from the security hygiene or in general in terms of like getting to a 
an, a state that is predictable, that is not where you want to be. Also, what we added over time was the so-called production mode. So the assumption is when you're in development, you don't really care about some settings so much like file handles and some configurations. Um, whereas when you go to production, you want to really have those set up correctly because otherwise you will fall on your nose pretty heavily. And people will always complain if that happens in production. So what we would rather do is fail quickly in production mode, have people fix that, and then set up a cluster properly rather than running into unexpected issues later on. And how that works is that here, some Java code, um, it's from the current release. Basically, what we are checking here is if Elasticsearch is only bound to the loopback interface, which is also the default, we're in development mode. Unless we change that and bind to other interfaces, so we could form a cluster, then we assume we are in production mode. And then you need to fix these specific settings, which I will show on the next slide. Um, you need to fix those um, to actually start the process. Otherwise, the process will terminate. Why is it not in a configuration flag? Because otherwise, everybody would just comment out the configuration flag. And everybody would say, like, oh, no, I'm, I'm in development mode. I don't want to fix this stupid thing right now. But for everybody's sake, you want to make sure that they are really in either development mode, or if they are not in development mode, then you want to fail hard and you don't want to give any workarounds. So there is no way around that. Um, here are some examples of file handles, um, specific garbage collectors, bugs in the JVM that we know that might corrupt your data. Things that will make your data terrible in production later on, and that's why we check them up front in those so called bootstrap checks. Common question is, can you run Elasticsearch as root? And no, you cannot, and obviously you should not, but it is not possible. So what we do here is, um, this is the example in our code um, where we check if you're running um, as root. So we are using the Java native access features to check that down here. If you're on Windows, we have no idea, and we don't know and won't check this, but on any Unix operating system where you have the concept of root, we will check that. And actually, when this definitely running as root, if this returns true, then we will just throw a runtime exception and say, like, you cannot run Elasticsearch as root because nobody should do that, right? And everybody agrees that this is a very bad idea if you try to do it. Well, Docker comes along and people get interesting ideas. And we see that on our issue tracker every now and then. Admittedly, this was a little while ago. Um, but here, somebody then just commented, well, this is merely annoying. I want to run my process as root. Um, if you have any security background, probably you're like, yeah, no. Um, I always call this the YOLO mode. So what I always imagine is that people assume that they have from their data stories something like this, YOLO. Um, and we don't run that way. Another thing that caused a lot of the bad security issues that Elasticsearch had over its lifetime was scripting. The obvious choice is you use a general purpose scripting language that is out there and people know it's easy to integrate for you, it's easy for your users to integrate. The problem is tightening down a general purpose programming language is surprisingly hard because there are often ways to break out of the sandbox or use some reflection to call something that you shouldn't be calling. And that's why a lot of the really bad security issues that Elasticsearch had over its lifetime were related to scripting. And what did we do? We created our own scripting language, which has the slightly unfortunate name painless. Um, and then often people will complain that it is actually not that painless to write, but rather painful. Um, so the backstory is the creator of that scripting language has chronic back pain and his dream is to be painless and that's how, how he came up with that name. It's not because we think that that programming language is, or scripting language is that painless actually. Um, but that we could argue. So the goals here were we want to have a secure language and we want to have a performant language. Um, the language was really written just for Elasticsearch, so just to expose the features that we deem 
correct or like the to be usable in the data store. So there is no way to break out of the sandbox because we control what is available in a language. Also, you can do some nice checks around. Um, you might run into some error later on and you might just block specific operations uh, like recursion or something like that. Also performance, um, making sure that stuff is cached and pre-compiled to make every iteration or call fast was another design goal of why we created this new scripting language. Um, there were other scripting languages before widely used, um, but we removed all of them mostly for the sake of security because again and again, they were causing some trouble. Another thing that we learned over time is that leniency is the devil. And one thing where we were lenient was content type guessing. So you could just run the curl command. So this would be in a relational database, the equivalent of select star from all the tables, basically. Um, so we are just using curl and we're running that query against Elasticsearch. And we're sending a JSON document, but we don't provide any uh, content type. And Elasticsearch would basically apply a very simple heuristic. It would say like, is the first thing that you have in there an opening curly brace? Well, I guess then it will be JSON. And then it will try to interpret that as JSON. So it will try to sniff that. Probably you can already see what might go wrong here. Um, if you have text plain that is treated as safe um, in course, and that can lead to stupid security issues. So for example, if you would use this very simple example with jQuery, what you would do here is we do this Ajax call, we do a post against, for example, localhost 9200, the default port where Elasticsearch would be listening. And this would insert a document into Elasticsearch right away because um, text is considered safe, whereas JSON wouldn't be considered safe. So with the like, right content type, this wouldn't work. But since we're sniffing out the content type, this request would just work. And you could easily delete data in a similar way or also write to another endpoint. So you could just do um, some cross-site request forgery. Um, because of that, by now you need to define the content type when you do a request. Something that Everybody knows it's a bad idea, default credentials. We had those for a long time and we called them Elastic and Change Me. And obviously nobody ever changed Change Me. And um, then it was pretty much pointless. Um, so we needed to find a better solution. And then people say like, yeah, well, this is easy. You just run some interactive thing in the installation process. The problem is it's not necessarily that easy. Um, looking at how all the operating or all the ways to operate and install Elasticsearch, um, maybe you don't have an interactive installation process. What if happens if you run a Docker container or if you use a Kubernetes operator? Um, many of these are different that you don't have anybody typing anything interactively and you need to find a generic way. So one way how we approach this is you can set an environment, that, an environment variable with a bootstrap password. And with that, you can then create your other accounts and go from there. Um, which leads us to another point. Um, clear text passwords are obviously not a great idea to have. Um, for that, we have added the option to have a key store, though so far the key should score Key store is only obfuscated and not properly encrypted. Um, but we will add password protection to that in the future as well. But for now, it only obfuscates your credentials, but it's still better than plain text passwords. Um, TLS certificates are always a joy, especially when you have lots of users and many of them are not so familiar with TLS and all the errors that you can run into. And also Java can be a joy to work with uh, around TLS. So we have our own binary to actually generate certificates for you. And you should use that. And we have invested by now a lot of time to also make the error messages better and actually help you get your certificates. Um, but TLS is one of the things that is, especially around security, a common pain point, unfortunately, still. Um, Authentication, um, 
Well, by now, authentication is freely available. So since 6.8 and 7.1, before it was one of the main things that we could monetize and build all the other features. And since it's all HTTP, you could always put that behind the reverse proxy, do basic auth um, from the reverse proxy, um, terminate TLS at the re reverse proxy, close down the data store through a firewall. But by now, and especially because of Kubernetes, because running a uh, reverse proxy in front of it is not that simple anymore and who communicates with who. Um, because of that, we have made the security features like role-based role -based access control, TLS, um, those are freely available and it is highly advisable to use those. Um, they're not on by default unless you have a paid version because then we would enforce that. Um, why? Because we only added them in 7.1. Enforcing um, authentication would be a breaking change and we will need to wait for the next major version. And if that ha will have authentication enabled by default, we're still working out because if we want to have that, probably we want to enforce TLS as well. And that might be a bit hard to swallow for some people to set up initially, but we will see and hopefully we will get there, but we'll see. Um, which leads us to the fun ransomware problem of, I have my data store and well, it only binds localhost, but I just want to let the world know that I'm running this, so I bind it to all interfaces. I don't set up a firewall. I don't set up a reverse proxy. I don't set up security. I just open it up. And then you can just find those on Shodan. Like you can just look for the default port of 9,200, look for anything that reports back with a 200 OK, and you will probably find some Elasticsearch instances. Every now and then you find actual data and have breach that is more or less a common occurrence. Um, a lot of them are by now probably also forgotten test instances or honeypots as well. Um, but what you will then normally get is if you just query that vulnerable installation here, for example, I just list all the indices that it has. And then we have this one index called please read. And well, we are friendly, we were interested. It has one document. Um, let's read that one document. And what you would then often get is something like this. Um, please send half a Bitcoin in this case um, to this address, and then you might get your data back or not. So the general idea is somebody downloads your data, keeps it safe, um, deletes it on your server, leaves that message. If you pay, you will get your data back, maybe. Maybe they have never taken that backup and will just disappear after you wire them the money. Um, also with the price of Bitcoins, um, they tend to be a bit volatile. So there was a time when uh, the ransomers actually said like, why are the dollar equivalent of this in today's Bitcoin? Because it was just fluctuating from one day to the next so much that it was unpredictable what you would need to pay. Um, but maybe by now it's a bit more stable again. But yeah, great use case for Bitcoin. Um, and then you might run into the Matroshka problem. So the Matroshka problem might be that somebody takes your data, leaves the message, this is how to get your data. Then somebody else, since your data store is still unprotected, might take that message, leave their own message and say like, if you want to get kind of like the original message, how to get your data back, you pay me first. So you can put one ransom attack into the other, and then you would need to pay all of them to maybe get your data in the end back. Um, that's what I call the Matroshka approach here, which might not be all that fun. Um, and we did run into that ourselves when we ran some test installations and we didn't bother to secure them. Um, the German CERT actually scans their IP space to see if anybody has any open Elasticsearch instances. And they might send you this uh, nice email to say like, hey, you have a problem there. You should actually uh, secure that. Um, then ideally you do and you don't get ransom. Um, so coming to the end here, starting off being a simple or being simple to start is probably the right to get actually the broad user base. But once you have more important data, more secure use cases, uh, more enterprise customers, then you really want to have these more security aware settings um, for running critical workloads. 
And I think this is kind of like a non-maturity process that you start on being very easy to get started to having a stricter setup over time. And I'm kind of afraid there is no real shortcut to that, but this is just a learning experience that you will need to go through as a product. Um, at least that's my thesis. Um, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. Um, we'll have a discussion afterwards, so let me know what you think about that. So to wrap up, we have seen that Elasticsearch does not bind to all interfaces anymore, only localhost. It doesn't cluster automatically anymore because it was convenient, but it was also dangerous. Bootstrap checks are just checks to make sure you run Elasticsearch the right way. And for example, you don't run as root, but that is never possible. Also, scripting was a common pain point that we fixed by writing our own scripting language, which introduced new pain points, but at least it seems to have fixed the security problem pretty well because we haven't had any security issues that I would be aware of since we introduced our own scripting language. So from the security perspective, that worked. Content type, um, yeah, requiring the right content type and not trying to guess um, will also help your security. Um, thanks to all the fun cross-origin requests that the browser can do. Um, having default and clear text credentials is clearly a bad thing. Requiring TLS, especially for anything that can form a cluster over the network, is probably what you really want to have. And yeah, authentication is a tricky subject um, that you should do properly. And hopefully we'll get to the point that we have this enabled and without making the bootstrapping process of a cluster too hard. So hopefully we will get there as well. Um, that's pretty much it. That's kind of the learning experience that we had over time. I hope you have learned something as well. Let me know in the questions and I'm happy to discuss with you. Thanks a lot for joining.